Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to bring to you the future. The future as told to me by over 300 of the world's top scientists that I've interviewed for BBC television, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel. And I ask these distinguished scientists the same question, the question that has haunted philosophers and theologians for ages. That question that I ask them is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? Probably not. But when I see a conference like this, and I see all these intelligent people, these movers and shakers, believing in a better society created by science and technology, then I am enlightened and heartened. Because today, we're going to talk about the next 20 years. The other question I ask these scientists is, where does wealth come from anyway? We have all this wealth that we see around us. They tell me that wealth ultimately comes from science and technology. But science and technology comes in waves that we physicists initiated. The first wave was steam power. We physicists in the 1800s worked out the thermodynamics of heat. We could calculate from a lump of coal how much energy you can derive to move a locomotive. 80 years after that, we physicists worked out the laws of electricity and magnetism. That gave us television, radio, generators, appliances, the electric age. 80 years after that, we physicists worked out the transistor and the laser, high technology, GPS systems, and the space program. So the question for today is, what is the fourth wave of wealth generation? If the first wave was steam power, the second wave was electricity, and the third wave was computers, the fourth wave, we believe, will be science at the molecular level. Artificial intelligence nanotechnology and biotechnology. They will be the drivers of wealth generation into the future. Computers, for example, will become so chip, cheap that they will cost maybe a penny a piece. Computer power will be everywhere and nowhere. In fact, the word computer will disappear from the English language. We will no longer say the word computer. In the operating room, doctors already have access to the internet. In the future, they will have access to artificial intelligence. In the middle of an operation, they will ask a computer for the latest information about surgery, about neurology, the heart, the latest information as they are performing the operation. Astronauts, will use artificial intelligence as they make repairs on the space station. They will consult with an artificially intelligent computer system as they make the repairs. You know, I live in New York City, and when I walk through the streets of Manhattan, I see all these buildings. I don't know who owns them. I don't know what their property tax is, the laws regulating them. I don't know anything about these buildings in the future. An artificially intelligent agent will tell me who owns these buildings, how much they cost, and make projections of the future as to whether or not they will appreciate, whether or not they will fall in price. Algorithms that predict economic activity. The future will be such that whenever we need something, we will simply ask, and it will talk back to you. So we're talking about a world where information is everywhere, and nowhere. Now today, children use virtual reality. That's for children. They put on goggles, they see a cartoon, and they create imaginary worlds. For adults, 
we have augmented reality. Scientists will be able to walk right inside a DNA molecule. Scientists will be able to walk on the moon, walk on Mars. Designers will design cars simply by waving their hands. This is augmented reality, where we take reality as it is, and then use artificial intelligence to tell us what reality could become. And if these goggles are too inconvenient for you, we will put the internet in your contact lens. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. They will blink and see all the answers to my exam right there in their contact lens. This is going to revolutionize education. No longer can we professors use memorization as the standard to learn science. In the future, you will see the periodic chart, the amino acids, boom, right there in your contact lens. Infinite information by blinking. And this means that professors will have to emphasize concepts, principles, rather than memorizing things that you're going to forget the next day anyway. So we're talking about a new world, a new world where if you can imagine it, you can create it. 3D printers are now so good that you can actually print merchandise. These shoes shown here were printed in a shoe store as you waited for them. Custom-made shoes printed for you as you wait for them in a shoe store. And jewelry. We can now begin to print with metals, which means that in the future you'll be able to design your own jewelry. This means that at New Year's, at birthday parties, if you want a present, a toy, you'll simply download the blueprint for the toy and print it out inside your living room. In fact, toys will become intelligent. And this is creating a problem for the English language. We're going to have a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft Works. That is also a contradiction in terms. And this is the future of the cell phone. Today, you have a PC a laptop, you have a tablet, and a cell phone. Why? Why? It's the same screen except different size. In the future, we will make intelligent paper, cyber paper, e-paper of any size. From your cell phone, you will scroll out as much paper as you want, type on it, fold it up, and put it back in your cell phone. In fact, we can make yards of this stuff. This is the future of wallpaper. Today, if your wallpaper is old, discolored, torn, what do you do? You suffer. That's what you do. In the future, you talk to the wallpaper. You go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Please change color. Please change design. Please change shape. And if it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you have a pain in your chest, is it a heart attack? Do you wake up the house, call for an ambulance? Or is it the pizza you had the previous night? What are you going to do? You go to the wallpaper and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to talk to RoboDoc. Boom. RoboDoc appears anywhere, anytime. Compliments of IBM and other computer companies. It is artificially intelligent with specialized information. This is going to revolutionize medical care. How many times do we have to wait weeks to get an appointment, and then weeks more for the diagnosis to come through? In the future, you'll simply talk to the wall and have access to medical care. And then if you want an MRI scan, how small can you make an MRI machine? Today, we can make MRI machines the size of a briefcase. That's the world's smallest MRI machine built in Germany. How small can you make it? According to the laws of physics, 
we can make an MRI machine this big. You are now looking at the future of medicine. You will talk to Robodoc, get almost free medical advice, scan your body with an object the size of a cell phone. So we're talking about a revolution in medicine and also a revolution in law. Let's say you're in a car accident. You're traveling through some small European country. You don't speak the language. You don't know the laws. What are you going to do? You're going to talk to your wristwatch. In your wristwatch is robo-lawyer. Robo-lawyer speaks many languages. Robo-lawyer accesses the local laws in any, any country and gives you sound legal advice. So in a world of augmented reality, you will see people and you'll see their biography next to their image. And if they speak to you in a strange language, your contact lens will translate it into English. You will be able to talk to people in any language because your, because your contact lens, your visors will translate. How many times have you been at a conference like this and you bump into somebody and you say to yourself, who is this person? I know this person. I think it's Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. You see him every year at this conference and here's his complete biography right next to his image. And tonight, you're at a cocktail party and there's some very important people at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. And transportation will also be digitized. We're talking about the digitization of life. These are cars of the future which have no steering wheel. Could you simply talk to them and they talk back to you? In fact, I think that one day, cars will become robots. The robotics industry will be bigger than the car industry because the car will become a robot. You'll talk to it. You'll argue with it. You'll go over the best itinerary with your car. And when you want it to park it, you simply tell the car, park yourself. And so you don't have to worry about parking the car anymore because cars park themselves. You talk to your wristwatch, you call for your car. Afterwards, you talk to your wristwatch and the car parks itself. In fact, you don't have to own a car anymore. You can lease a car because at night, why bother to pay for a car that you don't use? So this is going to change everything. Insurance rates are going to change because fatal accidents will be reduced. Parking spaces will become obsolete. This is going to change the way we live once, once cars become robots. And speaking about cars, we're going to digitize cars in Dubai, of course. We're already talking about flying cars. But what is NASA doing? NASA wants to make a supersonic commercial jetliner. It took me 12 hours, 12 hours to fly from Manhattan to Dubai. Think of what it would be like to do it in two hours, to hop in a plane in the morning, have lunch in Dubai, and be back in Manhattan in the afternoon. NASA says by 2025, we want a new blueprint for a supersonic transport. Now you may say to yourself, wait a minute, didn't we have that before? The Concorde, wasn't the Concorde a supersonic jetliner? Yes, but it had a fatal flaw. It was designed in the 1960s when our computers were only 64K processors. Those are dinosaurs. You know, whenever I see old, old videos of the space program, in 1969, we put two men on the moon, you realize that today, your cell phone has more computer power than all of NASA in 1969 when they put two men on the moon. In fact, I think it's criminal. What criminal what NASA was doing back then, sending humans into outer space, backed up by a cell phone. That's what they were doing back then. Well, now we have supercomputers. 
We can design supersonic airflow to create jets that have no sonic boom. The sonic boom is what killed the Concorde because we didn't have supercomputers. Today, we have supercomputers. We can model supersonic airflow to create jets with no sonic boom. And beyond that, we're going to go to Mars. It's now official. The President of the United States has stated that we're going to go to the moon and then on to the red planet. Starting next year, the United States will send a capsule around the moon for the first time in 50 years. We're going back to the moon next year. Soon after that, astronauts will be going around the moon, and then after that, on to Mars. In fact, spaceflight has gotten so cheap that private companies like SpaceX can now create the biggest rocket on the planet Earth. The Falcon Heavy is the biggest rocket on the planet Earth today. And how much did it cost the American taxpayers? Nothing. We got it for free. That is how cheap space travel has become, and that's also how expensive the private sector has been in terms of creating and picking up the ball for space travel. So it's on to Mars. Now, what am I building up to? What does all this mean? all these gadgets, all these conveniences. We're building up to something that I call perfect capitalism. What is capitalism? Capitalism is private ownership where prices are set by supply and demand, period. End of story. That's called capitalism. But capitalism is imperfect. Supply and demand are imperfect. You don't know who's cheating you. You don't know what the profit margin is. You don't know who's gouging you. You don't know what other people think about a product. That's imperfect. Plus, you have all these middlemen, all these middlemen that don't do anything except transport goods from point A to point B. Perfect capitalism is where we are going today. Eliminating the middlemen, eliminating all the friction of capitalism. So. For example, there are, of course, winners and losers in perfect capitalism. The winners are society. Society benefits. Things are cheaper, more diverse, better quality. But who are the losers? Every revolution has losers. The biggest losers are the middlemen, like brokers. Now, today, stockbrokers no longer sell stock. Now, that sounds stupid. Of course, stockbrokers sell stock. What else are they going to sell? No, stockbrokers no longer sell stock because stockbroking is a middleman's job. You can buy stocks on your wristwatch. Why do you need a stockbroker if you can talk to your wristwatch and buy stock? Because stockbrokers sell something that robots cannot provide. And what is that? intellectual capital. We're talking about experience, know-how, savvy, intuition, analysis, experience. We're talking about what robots do not have. That's where the jobs are going to be for middlemen. If they don't adapt to this, they will go bankrupt because middlemen are in the crosshairs of this revolution. So let's say you want to become a billionaire. After listening to my talk, you want to follow in the footsteps of Jeff Bezos, create the next Amazon. How do you do it? Not so difficult. First, you take a look at the marketplace and take an industry, any industry. Then you look to where there are middlemen, inefficiencies, friction, aggravation. And then what do you do? You digitize it. Such a simple formula. But that's what Amazon did. That's what Uber did. That's what Airbnb did. Eliminate the middlemen, reduce the friction of capitalism, create perfect capitalism. And so we're talking about a new world, a new world where people can take the initiative to create businesses. 
So what about governments now? I'm now building up to my main point. Governments can play a key role in this whole process. You realize that capitalism took 200 years to develop in Europe. 200 years for capitalism to take root in Europe. Now, developing societies can do it in one generation. These are some of the points. One thing they can do is to reduce regulations. Governments like to regulate. They don't produce anything. They like to regulate things, making production difficult. They have to reduce taxation. Because governments, what do governments do? They tax. But sometimes taxes can be such that it kills the goose that lays the golden age. So you want to reduce taxes. You want to stimulate investment by reducing red tape. Now, the other day, I started a company in New York. How did I start my company? On my cell phone. In America, you can start your own company on your cell phone. No red tape. You cut right through the bureaucracy. This is what we need. Less red tape, more initiative, more ideas to keep this thing going. And then you need educated people. One of the weak links in all of this is education. We have to make sure that we sponsor great universities, that we have great prizes, that we reward people for taking the initiative for creating something when nothing exists in the past. And then you have to learn how to make mistakes. You know, I travel in Europe a lot. I talk to European scientists. And the first thing that European scientists tell me is they want to leave. They want to leave Europe and come to America. Now, why is that? Europe has great scientists. Europe has great laboratories. But the problem is cultural. In Europe, if you make a mistake, it follows you. People know you made a mistake. They know your parents. They know your family. They know your history. If you make a mistake, it follows you in Europe, also in Asia. In America, we couldn't care less if you make a mistake. In fact, we say, what? You made no mistakes? What's wrong with you? How come you don't make more mistakes? Mistakes is how you learn. And that's what we do in Silicon Valley. We treasure those people who learn from their mistakes. And now let's talk about the digitization of the next great area, biotechnology. Huge. Baby boomers are aging. Alzheimer's could be the disease of the century. And we want to make sure that we can thrive in this new environment. First of all, diagnostics. This is a computer. It's the size of an aspirin pill. It has a chip in it with a camera and a magnet. You swallow it, and a magnet traces it as it goes inside your stomach, taking beautiful pictures of your large intestine. Because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. Middle-aged men fear the C word, colonoscopy. That's when they put that tube up your back. However, this gives new meaning for the expression, Intel inside. Yes, Intel will always be inside. We're talking about a new era, the digitization of diagnostics. And we're going to put these in your blood. Nanotechnology will fight blood cancer cells one by one. And how will we prevent cancer? We will unleash something called liquid biopsies and DNA chips. If you are a woman and you feel a lump in your breast and the biopsy says it's cancerous, then I'm sorry, it's too late. You have 10 billion cancer cells growing in your breast. Surgery is required immediately. You are on the operating table. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's today. Tomorrow, you will go to the bathroom, and your toilet will pick up proteins, genes, enzymes from your bodily fluids, enzymes, genes, and tell you that you have 100 cancer cells growing in your body. Your toilet will tell you 
You have breast cancer. Do something. You have 10 years to do something. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm telling you today is, in the future, the word tumor will disappear from the English language. We will no longer say the word computer. We will no longer say the words traffic accident. And we will no longer say the word tumor in the future. And the aging process is the next process to be digitized. We cannot digitize many of the organs of the human body. This is an ear. It is your ear from your cells grown in the laboratory. We can now grow skin, bone, cartilage, blood vessels, heart valves, complete bladders can now be grown, and windpipes can also be grown. The next organ to be grown, we haven't done it yet, the next organ to be grown is the liver. So for all you alcoholics in the audience, take heart. We will grow livers in the future. And another target is the aging process. Artificial intelligence may give us something that the kings and queens of old could never conquer, and that is the aging process. We now know why things age. Things get old and die because they accumulate error. Error. Error in the form of DNA mistakes, accumulation of errors inside cells. But now we have artificial intelligence. We can analyze millions of genomes of old people, compare them to millions of genomes of young people, and identify where aging takes place in the body. For example, we've already isolated 60 genes that are involved in the aging process. And where are they located? Well, take a car. Where does aging take place in a car? Well, that's obvious. The engine. Why? That's where oxidation takes place. That's where you have moving parts. Where is the engine of a cell? The mitochondria. And that's where aging takes place in the main. We've now isolated where aging takes place. And it's only a matter of time before we genetically modify those genes that are damaged. Why do we have to die? Some animals hardly die at all. The Greenland shark lives on the average of 400 years. 400 years is the average lifespan of Greenland sharks. And the next organ to be digitized is the brain. This is called the Connectome Project. World War II gave us the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. The 80s gave us the Genome Project and genomics. The next century could give us the Connectome Project as we map the entire human brain. By looking at blood flow, by looking at microscopically the wiring, we're now beginning to understand how the brain is wired up. And we can now extract images from the living brain. This is how artists will work in the future. Artists will think think of something, it'll materialize in front of them, and then a 3D printer will print it out. This is going to revolutionize the world of art. We're talking about removing all links between the human imagination and three-dimensional objects. We're talking about the Connectome Project. And of course, by hooking up the brain to exoskeletons, we can now give the gift of mobility to soldiers, people in car accidents, sports injuries, to give them the gift of life again. And the big announcement made two years ago is that we can now upload memories into the human brain. This was once considered to be preposterous, impossible, and now we do it on a regular basis. With mice, with apes, and now with Alzheimer's patients, we are uploading memories, recording memories, and this is going to give us a new era in the internet. The internet of the future is going to be brain net. We will send not digital. We will send emotions, feelings. 
We will send memories on the internet. This is going to revolutionize entertainment. Who wants to see a silent movie anymore when you can see the talkies? Well, who wants to see a movie when you can feel what the actors and actresses are feeling? And teenagers will go crazy. Teenagers put happy faces at the end of every sentence. In the future, you'll simply put the entire emotion at the end of every sentence. Your first date, your first kiss, your first senior prom, your first dance, all those memories on the internet as we upload memories. And not only can we upload memories, we can also photograph them as well. At Berkeley, where I got my PhD so many years ago, we can now begin the process of photographing a dream. This was once considered preposterous, but now we do it. Here's how we do it. On the left is a brain scan of the brain with 30,000 dots digitized. We put these 30,000 pixels in a computer. The computer recognizes images and prints them out. Here you see the actor, Steve Martin, at the top. Below that, you see a picture of Steve Martin created by the living brain through 30,000 pixels of blood flow recorded by an MRI scan. So we can now extract images from the living brain. And then if you fall asleep in this MRI machine, the machine keeps on going and prints out a picture of your dream. One day you'll wake up in the morning, you'll push a button and watch the dream that you had the previous night. So we're talking about the digitization of the mind. We're talking about BrainNet. Remember, we're making these discoveries even as we speak. This is a new, a new theory a new science in its infancy. And this is how we will go to the library of the future. Today, when you go to the library, you take a book out on Winston Churchill. In the future, we will digitize him. We will digitize every single video, every single recording, all his life experiences, and you will talk to him. This is called digital immortality. We're going to digitize everything known about historical figures. For example, I wouldn't mind talking to Einstein. I would be thrilled to have a conversation with, with the great genius. In the future, you'll be able to talk to your ancestors, or for the most part, maybe your descendants. Your descendants, hundreds of years into the future, may want to talk to you because you have been digitized. And so. We're talking about artificial intelligence being bigger than the automobile industry. Now, some people are afraid of this. They think that one day the robots may take over. Well, that's always a possibility. But for the next period of time, for decades to come, artificial intelligence is going to create jobs, industries, new opportunities, new fields opening up. But let's not be naive. At some point, maybe at the end of the century, robots could become dangerous. The tipping point is self-awareness. Fortunately, robots do not know they are robots. In fact, robots don't know anything about awareness. So we have nothing to worry about. But in the future, perhaps we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts once they become self-aware. Right now, our most advanced robots have the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, a lobotomized retarded cockroach. Our most advanced robots cannot pick up garbage. They cannot sweep the floor. They cannot do any of the things that we would ask them to do. The US Pentagon sponsored the DARPA challenge to create a Fukushima robot that could clean up the mess at Fukushima, and almost every single robot failed. So we have many, many decades to go before robots become a partial threat. Now I'd like to simply sum up and say a few remarks. One, we are headed toward perfect capitalism. You're going to have infinite knowledge of what you buy who you talk to, your surroundings, infinite knowledge, simply by asking for it. 
We're going to digitize all of society. We're going to have artificially intelligent objects do most of the tedious work around us. And the brain is the next major organ to be digitized. We're going to have brain net. And now let me end, end on the final note. When I was a child, when I was a child, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, I will be the great Einstein. You can put on my jacket and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day in the back, a mathematician asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great audience. Introduction to the future. Thank you.